Thank you to our, our praise team. What a great job. What a great time of worship this morning. Thank you to our sound people um, for really fixing us up and making that sound so great. We're so thankful. Um, i got to warn you in advance that I've had a lot of coffee this morning because I drove like 13 hours yesterday and I didn't sleep much, so I've been drinking all this coffee. And so I got the podium up here. I want to be very careful that I don't say something that I'm going to regret because, you know, that's happened before, like last week or the week before or something like that. But um, I want to talk a little this morning about how big God is, right? Have you ever noticed that some people have a hard time coming to grips with God? Have you ever noticed that? You want to know why? Because God is huge. He is so big. He is so hard for us to even comprehend. And a lot of people have a problem with things that are big. For example, take space. How many times does that come up in a, con a conversation? Think about how big space is. It is amazing that that is up there every day and that it never comes up in a conversation because it's so big. In fact, here's a homework assignment for tonight. Go home, turn the television off, go outside, and just look up. How come that is up there and it never comes up in a con con conversation? If we lived in a building, or if we lived underground, and there were only two or three places in the world where you could see space, it would be bigger than Disney World. People would be coming from hours away to stand in these huge, gigantic lines. And when they finally got to the front, we would all hold hands, and they would open it up, and we would be like, Oh! Look at that! Look at that! This was so worth the drive. Daddy, thank you so much for bringing me here to see space. But it's up there every day, and we just take it for granted, don't we? We will drive days to see the Grand Canyon. This one guy came up to me one time, and he was like, Dude, you've got to see the Grand Canyon, man. I sat out there and I looked at this Grand Canyon and it was so big, dude. I saw God in the Grand Canyon. I saw God. And I was like, you had to drive all the way to the Grand Canyon to see that? What about that? Those aren't light bulbs up there. Those are humongous nuclear explosions thousands, billions of miles away, and they go on for like forever. You just drove two whole days to see a ditch. You're a dummy. You can even see the bottom of the ditch. Why is that even a big deal? Yes, Space is big, God is bigger, and we are supposed to live like aliens. Like aliens. I couldn't leave this one alone. I had to ask, how many of y'all believe that there are aliens among us? Raise your hand. Apparently, it's a certain generation that believes this. Aliens among us. I'll be honest with you. This may be putting myself out there way too much at a church. But I used to not believe that aliens were among us. I spent years believing that they did not exist. Until a little while ago, I finally came to the conclusion that aliens are among us. And do you want to know how I came to that conclusion? I drove through the state of Alabama. If you're having a hard time believing that aliens are among us, drive through the state of Alabama. <laughs> but even if you don't get the opportunity to drive through the state of Alabama, they say that 
aliens have to be among us because they built the pyramids. And how do we know that aliens built the pyramids? Because now we have Netflix. And they say that the constellations line up with the shafts and they say that you can put like 35 Empire State Buildings into one of these giant pyramids. And maybe they have a point because it's probably going to end up taking us 10 years just to fix South Cleveland Street. So maybe it had to be aliens. Maybe they have a point. Maybe aliens are the only ones that can figure out that if you want to build something tall, you put more on the bottom and less on top. My son Solomon figured that out when he was three years old with his Legos. So I guess it had to take aliens to do something that Solomon can do. It had to be aliens. Oh. If you can convince people of that, you can convince people that any building over 100 feet tall was made by aliens. Speaking of that, how do those buildings even keep from falling down? It's so windy up there. I don't know how people over 6'7 walk around without falling over because of the wind over there. I'm about to read this scripture to you. And this scripture is very convicting to me personally. Because Peter wants us to know that we are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be like aliens. Now some of the translations use the word aliens. The one I, the, my Bible doesn't. I'm just going to read it to you from the English Standard Version. But Peter says that we should live like aliens. Um, chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Can I repeat that verse? Keep your conduct among the, let's just say non-believers instead of Gentiles, okay? Keep your conduct among the non-believers honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. I was doing good till I saw that last part. Honor the emperor. Okay, God. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, as we talk about these things that are sometimes tough to talk about, I just pray that your Holy Spirit and that your wisdom will fill this place. Give me the words that need to be said to talk about what this world is missing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. When you read 1 Peter, the whole book, you recognize something. You may not know all of the cities and all of the names and all of the places that the author talks about, but you recognize something. There's something similar to what he's talking about. Because he's writing to people who were living in a world that is openly hostile to the faith. Now, I know that every generation thinks that their generation is the worst ever. And every generation thinks that it's never been as bad as it's been right now. I would disagree. 
And I would think that the people of the first century would disagree as well. They lived in a time under Caesar. Caesar could have you killed just for the way that you opened your eyes. The first century Christians lived in some pretty tough times. He could take your life and there were no courts of appeal. And there were a lot of Christians who faced martyrdom because they would not deny their relationship with Jesus. So I know that we think our Congress is the worst ever. And we think our movies are the worst ever. And our music is the worst ever. And our culture is the worst ever. And we say that we don't even recognize this wonderful country that we're living in. And do you know what I would say to that? Get over it! Get over it! We've been here before. We know how to live in a land that is hostile to our faith. We've been here before and we know how to live in those kinds of circumstances. In fact, that's one of the main reasons that the letter of 1 Peter was written. To tell us how to live in such a way that people around us can see the gospel regardless of the culture. So what are the things that 1 Peter, Peter, Peter that book's not in the Bible, a first Peter tells us that how we should live. Well, number one, we should live a life of excellent character. Excellent character. The word that we would use would be holy. You should live a holy life. Now, I know that whenever you hear the word holy, we get a little scared because some of us have known some holy people, and we don't know if we want to be quite that holy. Right? We don't mind coming to church and we don't mind following Jesus, but we don't want to get to the point where we're different from everyone else. Right? We don't want to get to the point where we're sticking out for our faith. We don't know if we want to be quite that holy. We don't mind being faithful to Jesus, but only so far. But I will warn you that some of us will go so far with that that Jesus Himself will not be able to recognize you. The point is not to blend in. The point is to stand out. Regardless of the condition of our beloved country, we live under the authority and under the obedience of the teachings of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, He might have sent you into a particular setting. He might have sent you into a particular country, a particular state. And we obey that country's laws. We keep the peace. We follow even the emperor. We do whatever we're required to do as long as it does not go against the teachings that we find in Scripture. We are supposed to be different from everyone else. We are supposed to be different. Listen to me. Do you think that the world is mad at Christians? Listen, the world is not mad at us because we're different from them. They're mad at us because we're not different enough. Think about this for a second. The world is not mad at us because we're different. They're mad at us because we're not different enough. They look at our marriages and they see the same things in their marriages. They look at our divorce rates and it's the same as theirs. When they look at our lives, they do not see a man who loves his wife because he loves Jesus in the way that Ephesians 5 tells him to. When he looks at our wives, he does not see a woman who loves her husband because she loves Jesus in the way that Ephesians 5 teaches her to do. They see the same things with us as they face in their own world. And so they ignore our message because they do not see it in the lives that we live. First Peter tells us that we are to be and do you see what it said, that verse that I repeated? 
Do you see what Peter was getting at right there? Peter says, if someone is to falsely accuse you of something, if someone comes to me or comes to someone else and says, this person has been doing something wrong, we think this person is cheating, he's stealing from the offering, you know, that something is going on right there, live the kind of holy life that when they look and take your life and put it under a microscope, they will be so amazed by what they see there that it will cause them to break out in worship. Them falsely accusing you. When we get falsely accused, most of us want to go, poor pitiful me, why is the world doing this to me? We should look at that as a situation to say, look at me. To the point where when they look at you, they say, wow, what's going on with you? And you say it's because of Jesus. And it actually causes them to come to your church because they see what's going on in your life and they want to know how you got to the point that they can see that because that's rare in this world. But we say, Peter, in today's world, it's just too hard. Right? In today's America, it is too hard. Give me a break. In the time of 1 Peter, they lived under the power of Caesar. But now, Caesar is the answer to a trivia question. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is still being preached. Can you name the Caesars? Can you name the Caesars in order? The Caesars are an answer to a trivia question, but Jesus is still Lord of Lords and King of Kings. One day, the presidents of the United States are simply going to be the answer to a trivia question. But Jesus will still be the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The Gospel of Jesus Christ will still be being preached. Listen to me. I know this is hard to get. I know that it is, but listen to this. As long as Jesus is still the King of Kings, who the President of the United States is, is irrelevant. As long as Jesus is still the King of Kings, what movie Hollywood puts out is irrelevant. As long as Jesus is still the King of Kings, what an earthly denomination of churches decides to do is irrelevant. Do you understand that? He is the King. He is the King of Kings. What some kind of human bureaucracy decides to do is irrelevant. You and I are the church. We are the church. We are the church. And nobody speaks for us. Nobody speaks for us. Not some bishop, not some general assembly, not some presbytery, not some pencil, not anybody. We are the church. What some bureaucracy decides to do is irrelevant. And we are called to be the light that shows the way home. Now, the problem is, a lot of us don't want to shine that brightly. But the whole point of being a lighthouse is to be seen. The whole point is to be seen. Even to the point of confronting those systems that hold us hostage. Those systems that keep us in our addictions. Have you noticed that everything is a civil rights issue today? Everything. The civil rights movement, we celebrate the civil rights movement. We celebrate those brave men and women who made that happen. But that wasn't the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. That was the church. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. That wasn't sung at one of the political parties. That wasn't sung on the radio. That was sung in the church. Slavery, that was the church. Child labor laws, that was the church. 
We are the ones who hold the very systems accountable in this world. The systems that hold people down. The systems that hold people in their chains. The, people that, the systems that hold people in their addictions. We are the place that shows people what their dreams mean. Now some of you will say, well Tim, that sounds great but I don't really think living with just some amazing character is going to change the world. I beg to differ. We have two biblical stories that teach that it does. Joseph and Daniel. Joseph lived under a pagan king who thought he was God, but he had excellent character. He never did anything wrong, and he followed his God with such abandonment with some such reckless abandonment that this pagan Lord came to him and said, what do my dreams mean? Daniel lived in a horrible Babylonian culture that was much worse than what we live in today. And he lived such a life of integrity and character that it didn't matter if you threw him in the lion's den. It didn't matter if you threw him in prison. He stayed faithful to God to the point where the ruler of the world comes to him and says, what do my dreams mean? Both these two men of faith live such a faithful life that pagans come to them and say, tell me what my dreams mean. The church is who tells the secular world this is what your dreams mean. This is what they mean. You cannot understand the world unless you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is under the relationship with Jesus Christ that you see what your dreams mean. Paul tells us that we are supposed to be ambassadors for the kingdom. Have you ever thought about that? What is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who goes to another people under the authority of the one who sent him or her. We are under the authority of Jesus Christ. And Jesus has sent us to be His ambassadors to the places that you work, to the places that you go to school, to your neighborhoods. You are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be aliens. We are supposed to be so different that they want to know what kind of kingdom it is that we're representing. Live a holy life. Yes, God is big. Yes, God is big. But we have this big God on our side. And we are supposed to be aliens. Not aliens building pyramids, but aliens who show the world the truth the light, and the way. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we have...